Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Dr. Gregory Tucker. And uh, Gregory was recommended to me by one of my listeners. I get a lot of recommendations these days. And I forget specifically what he said, but I remember he was enthusiastic. So, <laughs> so as usual, I don't know a heck of a lot about uh, my guest, um, but it sort of works out well that way because then I, I, I don't know any more than my uh, listeners do, and uh, I ask questions that they might also ask, you know, not presuming that we know anything. So, Greg, you and I were talking um, the other day, trying to set this up, and um, you, asked, you, you said you'd like to start by asking me a question, but before you do that, um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? I mean, what kind of doctorate do you have, and, and what do you do with yourself? All righty. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to be on your show. Sure. Uh, I've listened to almost everyone you've interviewed, because wow. I have a, it's a captive audience, and they're all professing <laughs> to either be close to enlightenment or, in, or enlightened. Uh -huh. And therefore, if they're there, I want to see what it means to be there. So... You have a captive audience, and, and they're delightful, and they really are a delightful group. Um, let's see, I've been, uh, I got my doctorate in clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. I went into private practice uh, pretty fast. I have my master's in child psych, and I started in Cleveland, where I went into practice with a psychiatrist. He invited me to join him. And I was there for 22 years, and then I, my whole family, be, they were ardent skiers, and one of my sons wanted to be, thought he might like to be in the Olympics, so mm. I said, why don't we pack up and move to Sun Valley, and I'll start a practice there, and we'll be at the base of the mountain, and you can ski every day. Jeez, I wish I was your kid. <laughs> well, I can still adopt you, I suppose. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I'll send the adoption papers. I love skiing. Yeah, yeah, well... He was a great skier, uh, and we, we moved there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite an adventure uh, going from Cleveland to Sun Valley. Yeah. When I got there, there were no psychologists there, so I thought, well, it's going to be interesting. I'm going to probably see four or five people a week and have a little practice and write a couple of books and ski and take it easy. Well, all hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, within uh, three months, I had a practice of uh, 40 people a week. I uh, was working Saturdays. Uh, two evenings a week, huh. and I stepped into a tornado hmm. because it was the middle of the drug crisis, and all these wealthy kids were there, yeah. <clears throat> having all kinds of problems with cocaine and stuff. So my hands were full, and um, I, I enjoyed being there and practiced uh, for what was it, 28 years. Hmm. And uh, finally, we got fed up with the snow, my wife and I, and we said, let's pack up and move, and here we are in California. So that, that's a sh the short end of the story. Okay, good. And we'll get into the more subjective story uh, as we go along, you know, like, you know, your the spiritual dimension of your life, or consciousness dimension, or whatever we want to call it. Sure. Okay. So the question you wanted me to ans answer, and I presume you still do, is what, what I understand enlightenment to be. Is that is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, if if you ask everyone that question, they kind of look pretty uncomfortable pretty fast because we're talking about the, the question, is there such a thing as truth? Mm -hmm. And allegedly, if you if you recover it or reconnect with it, then apparently the outcome is something called waking up or enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I guess we're down to the question is, does truth exist? Obviously, philosophers have argued about it throughout the centuries. So, if enlightenment is something about reconnecting with truth, what do you think that means? Well, um, first of all, I, I don't tend to use the word enlightenment because it has so many connotations. You know, I mean, it's it's used so much, and and if we're going to use words at all, we want to be able to communicate something. And if if the person we're speaking to understands something completely different by a word we're using than what we understand by that word, then we probably should choose a different word so that we have a kind of a mutual mutually shared understanding. But um, but nonetheless, uh, having said that, let, let me give my take on it. And uh, I've, I've been giving a little bit of thought to your question, uh, although I haven't written anything down, and, and we'll see what comes out. And whatever comes out, it'll probably, it would probably be a different thing if you asked me the same question a year from now. But, um, but here's my take on it. 
Um, my and this is to a certain extent based on just you know thinking and reading and and kind of insight in that sense, and to a certain extent it's based on my experience, and I'm not sure where the line can be drawn between those two things. But my understanding, and to some extent my experience, is that the, the, there's a, a vast, that fundamentally the basis of creation, so to speak, is an is a infinite field of consciousness which is intelligent in its nature. And that intelligence has as part of its nature, part of its tendency, for whatever reason, the desire, the impulse to uh, diversify, to express itself. You know that saying from the Bible or someplace, I am one, may I become many. And over the last 13.7 billion years that we know of in this universe, uh, that incredible creative potency has been expressing itself and evolving into what we see as the universe today. And the general trend seems to be, from what I understand it, that uh, towards increasing sophistication. So, you know, you might start out with just blobs of molt or of gas or something which coalesce into, you know, suns which, co which eventually spin things off and, and those things cool and they become rock and, and so on. And, and and, and you know new elements are formed in those suns and uh, more and more complex elements and, and more and more complex uh, chemicals and compounds and so on evolve until eventually we, we begin to see you know what we call life uh, as we define it little tiny you know paramecium's and so on but nonetheless life and then those evolve and and things continue to evolve and what's essentially happening is that greater and greater complexity is being built and greater and greater ability in those in those complex increasingly complex forms to express or actually tra uh, you know, to express that intelligence which is innate or fundamental to their existence uh, and you know then to, to make a you know, skipping way ahead we get to the human level and we have a, an incredibly complex uh, form or mechanism uh, which uh, is highly conscious in other words it, it expresses or reflects to a profound degree that consciousness which is innate to everything whether a rock or a plant or a tree or a, an animal uh, but it expresses it much more fully than all those things I just mentioned and uh, you know as that evolutionary process continues a time comes when the, you know, the human being begins to question oh, what am I really uh, you know, and begins to reflect inwardly, uh, introspect. And <clears throat> again, to, to cut the story short, a time comes when the individual expression of the human being recognizes, wait a minute, I'm not just an individual human being. I am kind of this vast field of consciousness. And I think at that point, you know, rec the recognition, the, the, there's a sort of a full circle has taken place in which that field, which for the sake of play or whatever, uh, decided to diversify um, and in the process appears to have lost itself in that diversification. You know, each individual part has sort of lost recognition uh, of the, the greater whole. That recognition is regained in, when that, that realization of consciousness takes place in the form of a human being. And when that happens, it's such a profound thing for, for, to experience for many people that they feel that, that they have reached the, the sort of the, the zenith of evolution. They think, well, this is it. This is what enlightenment is. I've realized myself. I know what I am. Uh, I can give up the search. I'm finished. Um, but in my understanding, and uh, to whatever extent my experience, uh, it's just it's just a milestone and a fairly preliminary one at that, given the vast range of possibilities that exists. Um, and so, uh, you know, evolution continues, and you know, having established that uh, self-realization, and uh, initially it'll be fleeting and intermittent, but eventually it will be stabilized. And at least that's the way it is for most people. Um, having known that one is not merely an individual but is uh, consciousness itself, a field of dynamic silence, uh, there is still 
um, tremendous potential for growth uh, as uh, you know as a human being <laughs> and you know we have capacities for love and um, perceptual capacities and uh, you know um, all sorts of qualities and traits that may still well be in their infancy when uh, this self-realization dawns and in fact we can find examples of, of people who have apparently achieved self-realization but are sorely lacking in the development of some of these qualities so uh, the natu- so in that this field of consciousness or intelligence has this um, it has this conti- this drive or this tendency to continue to e- evolve its expressions, it's inevitable that we're going to continue to grow, uh, and it's going to conti- it's going to in- infuse itself uh, into every pore of our life, every facet of our life, and we're going to grow in compassion <clears throat> and intelligence and the ability to express these qualities, uh, to bring them to bear upon our environment. Um, and of course, you know, one thing that com- people commonly report when they wake up to this realization is that they always were that. And there's a sort of realization that they never had actually forgotten it. They just thought they had or appeared to have. It's, it's like, you know, when you finally see that the, the snake you thought you were seeing on the road is only a rope. You, you can see how it was all it was only a rope it never was a snake you know you can't it's, it's almost surprising that you ever saw it as a snake because it's obviously just a rope um, so like that uh, you know many people report that they they realize that oh I've always known this I've always known this was what I was I had just somehow overlooked it um, so now I'm starting to ramble, so it's good you interjected. But that's that's well, in a I, kind of a well, roundabout way my understanding of what enlightenment well, okay, is. Well, why don't we take turns interviewing each other? Yes, I please. Got a, I'd like to ask you, and then you can ask me. Very good. But it's kind of like let's let's reciprocate on the interviewer interviewee thing here. Uh, absolutely, I don't usually so, go on this long, but only you because use you the concept me. of do you use the concept of emptiness? And if you do, what do you think that means to empty? Because, you know, you read it in all the literature, mm-hmm. and everyone's talking that they're meditating to empty, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm considering, when you're empty, what are you emptied of? I think emptiness is one way of experiencing it, one way of looking at it. Um, and I suppose it depends on the context of how one is using it. Uh, but ordinarily one is sort of full of thoughts, full of activities, full of desires, full of all sorts of stuff. And you know this emptiness experience is more one in which you know one one found, finds that there's you know one rests in a silent field of awareness without a lot of content. Um, I presume that's the context in which people use it that you're referring to. But there's also the flip side of that, which is fullness. And uh, you know maybe that comes later on, or maybe that's just how other people experience it according to their makeup. So what is your point of view then about suffering? Who's suffering and what is our suffering all about? Because most of your, those you interviewed complain of a lot of suffering and uh, you know, engaging in lots of practices and doing lots of different things to see if they can't get at the core of their suffering, mm-hmm. at the origin of it. Mm-hmm. And some did and some didn't. And some, when they did, it was sort of immediate. And then suddenly they felt transformed. It, the suffering was disappeared. Mm-hmm. So I'm interested in the tipping point between suffering and not suffering. And and do you have any idea what that happens when that <laughs> happens to them, or at least when they report it? Yeah. See what I'm saying? Because yeah. in psychology, obviously, I'm working with suffering all day long because that's no one makes an appointment because they feel good. They make an appointment because they're suffering, and so I've always kind of kept a running journal of what is the real dynamic of suffering. What is it really? And how does it manifest, and why does it persist? What what keeps it in place even when your arm isn't broken and the lion is not chasing you and nothing's going on, apparently? But apparently something's going on because you're suffering. Yeah. Um, as you know, having listened to a lot of these interviews, uh, 
I was a student of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi for many years, and he used to like to shock people, especially in radio interviews, by saying, Christ never suffered. And of course, the interviewer, would, he, I remember seeing a, an interview with the Bishop of Downside in, in England back in the early 60s, and <laughs> Malcolm Muggeridge was interviewing the two of them together, and Maharishi said, Christ never suffered. And, you know, what he meant was that, uh, you know, obviously his body suffered and uh, he, he was there on the cross. No one can deny that if, if that was an historical fact that that happened. But what he meant was that from, from Christ's inner perspective, from his state of development, he resided in a field which was beyond suffering. Uh, he didn't identify with, with the body. In fact, he, he so profoundly identified with his divine nature that regardless of the extreme suffering his body was undergoing, his, that was secondary. His predominant identification, that which he knew himself to be, <coughs> was beyond the physical and therefore <coughs> was beyond the possibility of suffering. <coughs> so I would say that if that's a true analysis, that one suffers in proportion to how identified one is with the, you know, one in, one's individuality to the exclusion of one's universal nature. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you have an idea of who's suffering then? Me? Personally? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... You mean, can I evaluate whether a person is suffering Well, or I mean, the suffering obviously is rampant. It, it's, it's, it's the dominant theme in the world everywhere. It's, you, you can't barely get past it in turning on your TV set. Yeah. So the question is, what is all this suffering about? And how come at the macro level it, it doesn't moderate, it doesn't diminish particularly? It seems to be almost like a buzz, a constant buzz going on. And the question is, is that inevitable? Is that genetic? Is that part of our nature to suffer? Or is it an artifact? I don't really know. Um, it's obviously it's happening. Um, and so, it, you know, we can't sort of argue with reality in that sense. Um, but... I think we perhaps live in an age and in a place where, you know, suffering is more or less the norm, but there could very well be ages and places where uh, suffering is is the anomaly, you know, where, where it's the rarity and where, um, you know, contentment and happiness are the norm. And perhaps we're, we're going to shift into sup such an age. Some people think so. But uh, I think for that to happen, there would um, either have to be a really profound shift in just the whole external circumstances of life. But since I believe that, you know, our subjective condition creates and determines our external circumstances, I think that what's really going to have to happen is a profound shift in our subjective uh, development. And I think that that is taking place in more and more people. Whether or not it will take place to a sufficient degree within our lifetimes to see a, a more heavenly world, uh, is we don't know, but we can hope, you know. Sure. So, like, take Wayne Lickerman. Right. Uh, and what an allegory! His last name is Lickerman. Right. He was a raging right. alcoholic. Yep. I mean, I find yep. that fairly ironic and kind of cute. Mm -hmm. And he's a very interesting guy. But I mean, he was a raging alcoholic, and then suddenly one one day, one night, uh, inexplicably, like a lightning bolt, he knew he was all through drinking. It was yeah. his, his suffering with drinking was over, mm -hmm. and he was, you asked him a question: What do you think happened, or what what was this? What was the transformation? What was what caused the shift? And he said, "I don't know." And I believe it's true he didn't know, but on the other hand, it did trigger him his his becoming a seeker to see if he could find out the answer to the shift. And but he had, he had been going to satsangs, hadn't he, with Ramesh Balsakar or somebody? Yeah, yeah. And, and been doing that for a long time. So obviously there was the intention and there was the exposure to, you know, knowledge that he kept hearing over and over and over again. And, you know, perhaps at some point he just reached a tipping point where he was able to, you know, give up the alcohol. And in fact, the way I heard the story, he would, you know, go to the satsang in, in the morning or something and then be drunk by the afternoon. And, you know, it took him a long time to sort of finally reach that point. Yeah. Have you ever talked to him and asked him the question, so what, what happened to you? What occurred so that finally you, you knew you were done with booze? No, I should interview him sometime. It would be interesting. I mean, it's a fascinating question. And, yeah. I, you know, I got instantly intrigued 
But I was really intrigued by the fact that he was genuinely bewildered, apparently, why it was possible for that shift to happen. Yeah. And, and mostly those you interview, half of them do make that kind of shift. And I, my, my question is, can we dolly in and put the shift under the microscope to ask the question, what is that shift? Well, that is a good question. I think, you know, there are people, psychologists and, and physiologists, who do study that. Um, you know, here in where I live, in Fairfield, Iowa, there's a university, uh, Marshy University of Management, where everybody meditates, and <clears throat> there are physiologists and so on on the faculty who've been trying to study that kind of thing for years and, you know, look, studying brain waves and all sorts of aspects of physiological change, trying to determine what the physiological correlates to enlightenment might be, higher states of consciousness. Uh, but I don't, you know, personally I think that there's always going to be an element of mystery to it and I don't know if it'll ever be sort of really nailed down, cut and dried. I mean, we don't understand even how a single cell works, you know, much in, in, in its really, in its entirety, much less the, the entire brain, much less the, you know, the, the, the entire makeup of the person. Now, there are more esoteric sources of information and knowledge who would talk to you about subtle bodies and, you know, increasing sort of subtle energy and the evolution of the soul and so on and so forth. And so perhaps that has something to do with it. Uh, but I'm no expert. <laughs> Have you ever read Way Wu Wei? Um, no. I've read quotes here and there, but I've never actually read him. Well, that's where my story begins. Okay, good. Let's hear that. So, I'm a psychologist, mm -hmm. and I'm taking close notes on suffering because I'm interested in the in the dynamics of suffering. What is it? Uh, why is it so prevalent? Uh, can I modify it? Can I assist them to modify it? Do they want it to be modified? I mean, a lot of questions flew around pretty fast in the process of working with people who are suffering regularly. Mm -hmm. Okay, and most of the suffering is mental suffering. It's it's in the head, so to speak. Right. It's not. It shows up in the body, but basically, it's a function of the way in which they're thinking, or what, or what it what it is they're stuck in as a point of view that really possibly can't be supported. Anyway, uh, I was with a friend one afternoon. He said, have you ever read Wei Wu Wei? And I said, no. And I said, who's that? We were having a glass of wine. I said, He said, very interesting guy. I, I, I'd like to read it. I'll tell you what. He said, I read a, a, two of his books, and I didn't get a word, he said. Not a word. And I went, well, I can't promise you I'll get a word. But I took home his book, Open Secret, which I'm looking at right up there, and I read it all night. And the next morning, just like some of your those you interviewed said, the book was the thing. I mean, it absolutely dropped me to my butt. Hmm. I mean, it had been like I'd been punched. Hmm. And the reason why is that I was totally clear that he was telling the truth about something that I didn't want to know. How did, I, how did I know I was hearing the truth? It made the hair on my arms stand straight up. Huh. So being a good psychologist and aware of physiological responses and things, I concluded that my unconscious was absolutely actually hearing what he was saying, huh. but it wasn't, wasn't registering, so there was a disconnect between what he was saying and what I was allowed to know about what he was saying. Hmm. So. I went back to my friend and I said, that is an amazing book. He said, what did he say? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> but I will tell you this much. I know that's the book I've been looking for. I know it's going to change the rest of my life. And I know it's going to revise everything I think and do about psychology. Hmm. He said, how do you know that? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I just can't tell you. So he wrote eight books. And what I did because I, now I would, it turned into a very quick obsession because I knew I'd found something that was very important. I, I would read his eight books and take notes, and when I got to the end, I stacked them up, and then I'd start over again. Mm -hmm. Go through the eight, and then I'd stack them up and go through the eight, <clears throat> taking additional notes, trying to sort of synthesize his message. That's the and same thing that, uh, that Gary Crowley did. One of the people I interviewed, he just kept rotating his books and reading them all. For sure. Uh, what I was clear of 
is that what he had done was that he was a very scholarly guy, very bright, and he took all of Buddhism, all of it, all of Eastern philosophy, and deconstructed it down to its core principles. Hmm. And then he synthesized that, so he ended up with sort of like jewels of wisdom, okay? And then he put, it, put them in his eight books. Now, the problem is he was, he, I think he identified what the truth might be. I mean, I think that's why the hair on my arm stood up, because the truth he was trying to disseminate was something I absolutely only knew at some pre-conscious level with no conscious awareness, okay? Mm -hmm. But I figured if I read it enough times, I might get through, and I, this is the word, I didn't make it up, but I certainly use it, I might punch a hole through my own amnesia to see what's on the other side. Mm. Because actually fear is truth bleeding through amnesia to give you a message that you're out of, you're not in, in alignment with the truth. Mm -hmm. And that the problem is, if you're out of alignment with the truth, the consequence of being out of alignment is suffering. Mm -hmm. And that when you can reconnect with the truth, so that you're back in align with, alignment with it, the lie you're defending to obscure truth subsides. No, I'm sorry, the, the law you're... The lie you're defending. The, the lie you're defending, okay, yeah. To obscure truth... Right, subsides. Subsides. Right, didn't catch that word at first. Yeah, yeah it subsides. And that might, really got me to thinking about a number of things, a, a couple which I'll, I'll name for you. Mm -hmm. Why was it so many clients came to me saying they're suffering and they need some skills and some clues and some techniques and some ways of modifying their suffering at the conscious level the mouth was saying that and yet what, what came into focus <clears throat> at an unconscious level is that they were doing everything possible to see to it that nothing worked <laughs> yeah so we have a paradox the mouth at the conscious level is saying one thing and the truth coming from the unconscious is, is sending a different message and the two are kept obscure by amnesia mm. we're not going to see the truth well, I had no idea when I saw that that I was possibly witnessing them, them working overtime to keep truth in the unconscious, out of sight and out of mind. Hmm. What you begin to see is that if you take consciousness and arbitrarily divide it into two chunks, the, there's the foreground chunk, which is what you're apparently doing here, and then there's the hidden background chunk that resides on the other side of amnesia, which is really dictating the truth of what's going on, mm -hmm. which you don't want to see over here. So over here, you're sort of, you're, you're performing, you're, you're actually, you're actually impersonating being a being. Being a what? A being. A being. You're, imper you're impersonating being a specific kind of person. Right. Shakespeare said all the world's the stage and right. the men and women are merely players. and. Mm -hmm. It, it looked like he knew what he was talking about. Right. Okay. And on the other side, there's the truth of who you are, who is actually dictating who you're pretending to be. Mm -hmm. So that waking up now really isn't about who you pretend to be. It's about reconnecting with who you are, who's pretending to be who you're pretending to be. Right. Can you follow that? Yeah. Now, enlightenment is a worthless term. Why? Because enlightenment is reinforcing who you pretend to be, who's a seeker to try to find out who you really are. Yeah, it, at least it's often taken that way. In other words, people well, people say things like, "I am going to get, I am going to get enlightenment," as if it were a thing one could get. You know. Yeah. Well, he, it's very clear that the the I is part of the imposting as being a person. The I actually then is going to use the concept of being a seeker to get in the way of finding out what you're seeking. Mm -hmm. Because as long as you re reinforce the I, you're never going to find out that the truth is not I, not I, right. not the I you're purporting to be, but not I that lives on the other side of amnesia. Yeah. Okay? So, what I began to see is that my clients were stuck defending who they were impersonating as if that's who they were. Mm -hmm. And that defending the lie you are who you're impersonating is, well, first of all, it's a first full-time job. <laughs> Secondly, it is incredibly exhausting. Right. 
And three, it's a hoax because you can't be who you pretend to be, so you're always spinning your wheels in the mud. Mm -hmm. Now, amnesia shields you from the truth of what you're up to so that, so that you don't have to reconnect with truth. So the irony here is that the truth is, it looks like amnesia is saying, truth is the enemy. We don't want to reconnect with it. We don't want to know what it is. Because whatever it is, it will blow our cover and reveal that we're not who we pretend to be. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, what I got from that is, how am I going to work with clients thinking they are who they pretend to be when they're not, and I'm supporting the fiction they are who they pretend to be because I'm a psych psychologist working with people who have a damaged self. And the question is, if there is no self, which Wei Wei says a thousand times, then how do you repair an invented self as if it's something's wrong with it? <laughs> right. Okay? So, paradox and dilemma. Mm -hmm. What do I do? Do I quit the practice because it's obviously at some level absurd? Or do I begin to see if I can figure out what he's saying and incorporate it in some sort of a model that I'm still used to mm -hmm. and find a new way to work with clients. Now, let's get to what he really said that dropped me to my knees. He said, all life is a dream. Mm -hmm. There are no people, not one. They're all dreamers in the dream and they're featured in the dream as, as the main event in the dream, impersonating people. And that as long as we impersonate who we're impersonating, albeit a superior being, an alcoholic, uh, uh, an inadequate being, whatever it is we're doing here, misrepresents who we are, because if there are no people, how can anyone have anything wrong with them? So his basic thesis is, which he abstracted from Buddhism, and he, and he's, he deals in the abs absolute, not the relative, is that the problem is there isn't anyone to have anything wrong with them so that life as an impersonator is how are you going to defend the life something's wrong with you and make that the core of who you are mm -hmm. obviously if there's nothing wrong with you and you're going to invent a self that's damaged in order to portray a damaged being you're going to have to put all your energy into your lie without knowing you're lying mm -hmm. and that's so okay right so you can begin to see then that suffering through his eyes, which is his synthesis of, Buddha, of the hardcore absolute Buddhism, is that we're suffering. The dreamer in the dream is suffering from impersonating a person. Now that sounded initially quite crazy to me. I thought maybe the man was certifiably bonkers, <laughs> and yet I kept going back to the hair standing up on my arm, saying, "What?" If, if what if what he's saying has in fact some validity then he's talking about an entirely different view of reality than the one all of us show up to support in which we're reinforcing the fiction life is about people and that there are people to suffer because what he's saying is the dreamer's suffering in defense of the lives of person and that there is there are no people to suffer now you wonder if Christ knew that did Christ know this is a dream? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. They're bonkers, Dad. They're bonkers. Did he know that there was no one to suffer, and therefore he didn't suffer? If he knew he was a dreamer in the dream, uh, and there's no, there are no people, then there are no people to suffer. Did he know that? Well, Wei Wei says he did, mm -hmm. and he Wei Wei says the really. The ones that woke up are the ones that got it. There was no one to have anything wrong with them. So the dilemma for me wasn't working with clients. I finally caught on. They didn't want to part with suffering because that's what they used to play the part of a victim. The dominant theme in reality, if you finally statistically take a good look at it, is that the vast majority of us are filling up time in one way or another reinforcing the idea that the self we have is damaged and that we're some kind of a victim. Now there's a kind of collective consensus on this side of amnesia to support that fantasy. 
we listen like, oh, you know, we know how to all reinforce the idea that someone has something wrong with them. And it rarely crosses our mind that we're impersonating that and that there is no one to have anything wrong with them because there is no one, period. Why? Because mind is dreaming you in the dream, doing what you're doing in the dream. So, I reasoned, how about if I assemble a brand new way of working with people and forget the concept that there are people to work with and work as a dreamer to another dreamer in the dream about what they're doing in the dream to keep suffering in place in order to impersonate a person. Mm -hmm. And I slowly began to put that together. And I called it the recovery process. Uh, that's all I do these days. I don't work with people. And I'll tell you something interesting. The, the more you work on, with information on the other side of amnesia, you really see that there's a, a huge body of, of stuff there, information, which really coheres, is set, makes sense finally, and seems factual if, uh, if out of sync with the traditional views that we support on this side of amnesia. So there are really two worlds going on. There's the world which we love to call illusion, uh, which really isn't illusion. There's no such thing as an illusion. Okay? That what there really is, that the dreamers in the dream, in defense of the lie their people, call what they're doing an illusion to reinforce the idea there's someone to, to be stuck in an, in an illusion. It's, it's fairly funny if you think about it. So the work I do is to see if I can't the normal process is to go five, four, three, two, one, zero. Zero being uh, zero duality, uh, zero drama, zero act, zero reactivity, uh, zero uh, emotionality. That you end up what way away in a state of benevolence. When duality disappears, you're not using emotion to play the part of a person. And most of us are endlessly, a la Shakespeare exaggerating the part we play because we're working silently in in, in, in in league with one another to keep reality in place as we define it and want it to be as opposed to what Wei Wu Wei says it is. So what I do is the recovery process and what I do is instead of going five, four, three, two, one, which is the normal progression, isn't it? You start with, with where you are now, you start go through layers of, of confusion layers of deception, and finally, inch by inch, five, four, three, two, one, you begin to pass through the other side and find out that what wakes up is not a person, but the dreamer wakes up when it lets go of the lie it's a person. Instead of a person becoming enlightened, the dreamer drops the lie, the person it's impersonating, and the dreamer wakes up, and he calls that the end of bondage. Mm -hmm. Bondage ends and the dreamer really realizes, one, it's not possible to be a person in a dream, and two, defending the lie you can prove you're a person in a dream it, it, it is what suffering is all about, particularly if you're going to document that, you, that you're, something's wrong with you because you have a, a damaged self. And so that my question about emptiness is, emptiness is letting go of the lie you're a person and we usually do it because we're featured in the dream, reluctant to let go of the lie. We do it piecemeal, one piece at a time, mm -hmm. until finally on the other side of amnesia, you're actually then centered in being a dreamer in the dream, right? Mm -hmm. Who's having fun watching other po others portray people. And so that you end up being whimsical, uh, you, you end up being spontaneous, you end up not being reactive, you end up being not being judgmental because all those concepts reinforce the idea there's someone to assess someone and judge them. If there's no one to judge anyone, then judgment obviously at some level is comedy. Okay? Mm -hmm. And believe me, on this side of the of the equation, time is filled with judgment. Everyone's judging everyone. Everything's assessed. Everything's dualistic, good, bad, right, and wrong. Now, what he says is it in the process of, of, in the dream, creating the lie we are people, you have to do it with duality. We're featured creating duality, and this is tricky. To defend the fiction, it's possible to ex exist outside of the dream, mind is dreaming. Now, if right now is the mind is dreaming, like right now, 
uh, how are you going to step outside of it? You can only do it with the trick called duality in which you're going to really argue that you're not in the dream, you're outside of it, and you're having a life. Mm -hmm. Wei Wei is very clear, if there are no people, dreamers are purporting to have a life as if they're outside the dream. And in reality, there is no one having a life. Now, what's intriguing about him, well, he's very intriguing, but what he's intriguing, what's really intriguing, is that he, what he's saying is, the last thing the dreamer wants to recover is that it's not possible in a dream to be a person. So, literally then, truth is treated in the dream as the enemy. You don't want to go there. You don't want to hear that. There are certain gurus out there that are sort of alluding to it, and instantly when you're around them, you get a little nervous because they're sort of already challenging the credibility of, of your reality as an actual being. And what they're saying is, they're alluding to it, whether they're read, read Wei Wu Wei or not, or just have studied a lot of Buddhism, or have done a lot of meditation, because in the process of meditation, pretty soon into the process, the self starts to disintegrate and disappear, it vaporizes. That's the exact moment when many dreamers posing as people meditating quit. Because as they start, as the, as the invented self, self starts to vaporize, they get really nervous. Mm -hmm. Because the next consideration beyond that is maybe there isn't anyone to have a self in the first place. Or even funnier yet, what if there isn't anyone at all? What if the whole thing is happening in the dream mind is dreaming, including inventing a self to play the part of a person believably? Mm -hmm. Okay? So, so is, what I finally decided was shall I work 5, 4, 3, 2, 1? which I already know means that by the time you reach three, you're going to run into a, a wall of resistance and amnesia, because there's going to be a fight. Dreamers don't relinquish their grip on the lie they're a person easily. It comes real hard. Mm -hmm. And that's built into the dream. That's not that's not that people are, 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 are a problem, because there are no people to be a problem. It's built into the dream that the dreamer is going to hang on to the lie he's a person, come hell or high water, and if the dreamer persists in sort of insisting that I am going to wake up because I'm, if something's not right with me, I'm engaged in something that feels phony and unreal, and I, I believe I can get past that and experience something which Wei Wei refers to as liberation. What the dreamer is liberated from is the lie that goes with defending the lie you're a person. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I reason why work five, four, three, two, one? Why, why not start with the truth and find out what you do to pretend you can, you can, you can cancel truth? Start with the truth that this is a dream, and you're in the dream or in the dream. And why don't we take a look at what you're doing in the dream to defend the lie you're a person? So I've already bypassed some of the resistance because I said, "Are you be willing to play at this level?" We're playing a game. I'm not asking you to buy it. I'm asking you to consider. That are you willing to consider that this is a dream and you're a dreamer in the dream, and that you're doing certain things over and over again to sustain the fiction that you're going to successfully prove in the dream you are a person? And I'm getting good results. All I can tell you that the results are fascinating. I work with a group of artists, celebrities, people who have some money, that have heard about what I'm doing, want to do it. Mm -hmm. And this much I can tell you. On this side of the equation, over here, everything's mythology because there there are no people. There's dreamers impersonating people, to the extent they think they are the people they're impersonating. So that language on this level is all metaphorical. As you cross over the line on the other side of amnesia, it become it doesn't it is no longer metaphorical. It's direct language from the truth. This is this is a mind generated dream, and you're a dreamer in it. So all the language changes now. When I'm working with a client, they start to realize that the old language doesn't cut it. And they start shifting to the new language, albeit reluctantly. But slowly as they use the new language, they, then what comes into focus is maybe what we're talking about could be true, Greg. I'm not saying it is. Mm -hmm. and It still could be crackpot. But you know what? I do find I'm intrigued and I do find it's something I want to do. And, I'm, and we're having fun because we're both talking about how we imposter being people. See what I'm saying? Yep. 
so that you're already in the same ballpark. You're already learning to use the same language. You're already considering that suffering is a consequence of unsuccessfully trying to document that you are some kind of a person, and more often than not, someone who's ruined, someone who's damaged, mm -hmm. someone who's defective, someone who needs repair. Think of how many self-help books sell predicated on the assumption that someone has a damaged self and this book will fix it. Now, if the self is invented, how is the self-help book, book going to fix an invented self? They, they all end up as doorstops. Every self-help book, if you finally there's a, a run on it, it'll be good for three months, six months, nine months, and then finally they will end up as doorstops. <clears throat> At some point, you have to ask, why is that? Why is it? Why is that? Why is it that way? Because how can a self-help book repair a non-existent self in which you're defending the life, the one you have is broken, when there isn't anyone to have a broken self? When you see that, those books are laughable. So what are you working on on the other side? You're working on accepting the fact that you're in the dream mind is dreaming. You're not running the dream you're in. You're in the dream and it's running. The thing that's most alarming about that is if you're in the dream that mind is dreaming and it's running is, then you're not running a damn thing. Mm -hmm. Ever. You know what that does to the concept of control? It blows it out of the water, and I'm telling you, if you want to see someone get upset real quick, just to allude to the possibility, not only that they're not running th anything, but they're not running anything because it doesn't exist to be run. Mm -hmm. It's delusional. Okay? The shift from the truth on this side of the equation to here is delusional. If on this side, you end up objective. I don't mean as an object. I mean aware. Objective, uh, rational, appropriate, and non-delusional. The minute you depart, using duality as the trick to try to confirm you are a person, from T, which is true. At T1, you're already slightly delusional. At T2, oh my God, you're picking up steam. By the time you reach T5, you are quite nuts, but you're in, you're in the majority who's nuts. We're all quite nuts. Defending the lie we're people. At T10, you're certifiable and you're, you think you're Jesus and you're walking on the street and whatever, you know. So, <clears throat> the truth is, on this side of the equation, if mind is all there is and mind is dreaming in this dream just the way it's happening, then there is no duality. Of course. How could there be? There's no such thing. So it's the dreamer in the dream who creates duality to defend the lie. It's the person that's been personated. And literally, as you see, the more you use duality to defend the fiction, you are the person you're impersonating, the more you suffer. Why? Because you're trying to use something that doesn't exist as if it will work for you to prove you are who you pretend to be. I mean, we're talking madness. Now, on the other side of the equation, as you start to let go of the lie you're a person, there's a tipping point at which you start to having fun comedy with who it is you pretend to be because you're not who you pretend to be. And you can even make fun of your own self, mm -hmm. the fiction you have one, okay? And in fact, what comes into focus, and Wei 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 says it, by the way, if you read his books, he's outrageously funny, mm -hmm. un unbelievably funny. He'll double you up with humor because like a good comedian, he catches you in the lie you're disseminating, but not in a mean way. It's just like he snapped you around, so you kind of go, whoa. I didn't see that, but I am really quite an imposter. Okay? Uh -huh. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And cool. that's the kind of work I do. <clears throat> and I have no idea what you think about it. And um, <laughs> I gave up caring what dreamers posing as people think about anything. <clears throat> My initial thought is um, I, I keep wondering... To what extent, uh, you know, this has, this is an intellectual construct based upon thinking about it so intensely for so long and reading those books over and over and over and over again, uh, or and to what extent it has shifted your actual, you know, nitty gritty moment to moment uh, experience of life, you know, uh, walking down the street, shop, going in the supermarket. Uh, stubbing your toe, getting the flu, breaking your leg, you know, making love, whatever you do, uh, how, how is your orientation to all those experiences different than it was before you embarked on this whole exploration? 
Well, most of the time on this side of the equation, where you're on this side of amnesia, where you're busy impersonating a being and using a broken self to sort of document that, you're really stuck in the lie you are who you appear to be. Mm -hmm. And you have no conscious awareness of what you're really doing, okay? When you start to shift from this side of the equation to this side, which I call the, the movement from here to here, is that the dreamer wakes up to let go of the lives of person, you suddenly realize that all, every second the dream is on. For instance, right now mind is dreaming us talking. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no one talking. Mind is dreaming us talking right now. Okay, and you can say that intellectually, but there's a funny tipping point where suddenly what I just said becomes a fact, and you experience it to be the truth. That there, like the scan does, you know, there's no one's talking. The dreamer is talking in the dream, and if you pay close attention, most talking services the lie dualistically that we are the people we impersonate. Most talking services duality. So that talking on the other side of the equation is non-dual. Now what is mind dreaming? Now what are you doing in the dream? Well, my leg hurts. Well, you have a leg in, and you're in the dream and you have a leg that hurts. That's right. So it's not personal anymore. The word, look, the, it's the end of personalizing anything at all. Because if there are no people, how could anything be personal? Not telling, experiencing that is transformative. It really feels very different. So that the concept of criticism disappears, judgment disappears, and you're more interested in the dreamer's plight as to how he's suffering trying to document and sustain the fiction that he's going to successfully prove he's a person and he's not going to pull it off. You have compassion. You know, you've been there. You know what that feels like. You know what sustaining that lie feels like. So I am saying it is a very spiritual experience to be in the dream, aware that the dream is on and you're in it, and that you don't run it, you're flowing with what's happening. Mm. You, you give up thinking that you, you can, it's okay to pretend you have plans. I say that to clients, you can have plans, but for God's sake, don't assume they're going to turn out the way you plan them. <laughs> so you know, uh, let me just uh, interject, there, there was some emergency while you were doing all that where the dog came in with a dead animal or something, I got a little bit distracted. But <laughs> See, see now look, if the dream is on, the dog came in, in the dream, something about a dead animal. Right. Now, is that in reality or is that content in the dream? Oh, of course. I mean, we can say, well, we'll explore around this whole thing, but I mean, if, if you're driving your car and a kid run, goes in front of you on a bicycle or something like that, you know, you slam on your brakes, you, you do what you can to avoid him, and, you know, in that nitty-gritty moment, you're not sort of thinking about whether this is a dream or not. You're reacting and doing the best you can not to hit no, the, the... The dream, in all probability, will feature you slamming on the brakes. Yeah. The question is, did a person slam on the brakes, or did the dreamer in the dream stuck in the fiction that's a person slam on the brakes? Yeah, but my question is, um, is that a concept that, you know, after the near miss, or maybe you hit the kid or whatever, is that, a, is that something that you sit down and think, whoa, the dream really got intense there? Or is there something in the nature of your experience throughout the, that entire little incident which is radically different from the experience of someone who has never considered this stuff? I mean, you know, an intellectual understanding or a concept um, is easily thrown off by... Okay, you understand, yeah. on this side of the equation, mm -hmm. what goes with uh, sustaining the fiction you are the person you're impersonating is the concept of intellectuality. Mm -hmm. See, if there are no people, please explain to me intellectuality. Parenthetically, what we're talking about, from, from, what, from the perspective of, of reconnecting with the possibility that we're in a dream that mind is dreaming, mm -hmm. you understand if that's the truth, then truth doesn't sell. That's yeah. not... If 99.9% of the dreamers are, per, are purporting, purporting to be people on this side of the equation, mostly playing the part of the victim, they sure as don't want to hell, don't want to hear in hell that they're dreamers. No, no, no. Because they're busy defending the lie they're some kind yeah. of a person and that they're having a miserable life and their money and their house and their children and the Right, dog they take guy. all that very seriously. Yeah, and when, you see, everything serious on this side of the equation, as you get reconnect with the fact that this is a dream, seriousness dis disappears and it's not that you don't care it's just that you're not reacting to it anymore as if it's content in in something called life it's content in a dream 
Yeah, so I mean that's sort of speaks... I, I worked with I we, we can get to, but I worked with post traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. and I'm telling you, the psychiatrists are have the wrong view of how to treat those guys. Mm -hmm. I promise you. Well, what you said sort of speaks to my question, which is that um, you know, for all this to be of of practical value, I feel it has to be experiential, and uh, you know, one can read a thousand books and still be you know very much caught in the dream as you put it and very much uh, caught in suffering but if it has really seeped into the pores you know really kind of into the gut then <clears throat> it does profoundly shift uh, you know the the entire quality of your life the entire nature of your experience um, I mean when I was 18 year old years old I was reading Zen books and I could pontificate for hours you know and, uh, and I didn't know what the heck I was saying but I could go on and on with with a conceptual uh, rap, you know, yeah. but, uh, you know, then... So what, I mean, you were a dreamer playing the part of an intellectual kid who could rap at an intellectual level. Yeah, I could talk about spiritual concepts, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I could yeah. even talk about them as though I were experiencing them. But uh, I, I bet you were still featured in the dream thinking you're a person who's pontificating. Yeah. Now, this whole thing about being a person or not being a person, I tend to... Uh, not take a sort of a this side that side attitude but more a, an all-inclusive thing where on some level yes you're not a person and on some level yes it's you know as uh, you know it is a dream but on another level the, the dream has to be you know when you if you're a scientist for instance and you're studying biology and you you know you're looking into the way cells work and so on and so forth uh, you know, there's or you're a baseball player, whatever you are. There's, there's a. Hey, hey, hey go Rick, ahead. What are you gonna say? If, if this is a dream, how yeah. many scientists are there? Of course not. From the perspective of this being entirely a dream, it's it's a it's, the whole thing is an illusion. As, as Shankara said, when the elephant chased him, the the illusory elephant chased the illusory me up the illusory tree. You know. But that kind but, of. But, but what happens to your to your consciousness and and to your sensitivity and to your humor and your goodwill when you no longer are trying to compete with others as to who is going to successfully prove they're a person? I mean, everything drops out of the equation because you understand if there are no people on this side of the equation and all the dreamers are are competing to see who's going to successfully document that they are one, often through suffering, by the way. Mm -hmm. Suffering's really popular. You know, we go, woe is me, isn't it awful all this suffering's happening? Don't be so sure about that. Without suffering, how does a dreamer s substantiate that it's a person? So it reconfigures the whole way you look at suffering instead of being upset about it. What I do with clients, I say, why don't we use your suffering constructively as indirect proof that you're trying to prove you're a person and you're failing in suffering because you're failing. And they go, I never thought of using suffering constructively. That is crazy. <laughs> But you know what? It kind of resonates. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Uh-huh. So, it's not that you don't witness the scientist working. You, you witness the dream is on and it has a scientist in it. It's not that dreamers don't get, that marriage doesn't occur. Marriage is, is, is an event in the dream in which two dreamers, for whatever reason, often for mischief and trouble, find each other to engage in something in the dream called marriage. Mm-hmm. And I also found out because I did thousands of hours of marriage counseling, two dreamers unconsciously find each other to make life awful. <laughs> really awful. In All fact, right. I coined the phrase awfulization. And when you really wake up, you can listen to someone awfulizing. It, it isn't abstract. In fact, it's transparent. And I can get a couple in marriage counseling to laugh because they're going at it and I'm saying, so who's winning the contest today? And they'll burst into laughter and go, well, we, we were doing it again. I'm trying to prove he's uh, he's bad and I'm good. And I'm going, what if there's no one to be either? Aren't you funny? You are really funny. You're cracking me up. Right. And they begin to go, so we're both trying to prove we're people and we're taking it out on each other. And I'm going, yeah, they're locked into sort of being, into the individual perspective to the exclusion of their their non-person universal nature well i mean if, you, if you're surrounded by non-persons and they're all going to try to document they are persons 
it gets pretty wild out there in terms of grandstanding, name dropping, who's got the biggest car, who has the biggest tits, you name it. I mean, it's <laughs> outrageous. Yeah. And at some point, when you see that that's not a quality of people, that we're, we're absurd people, that's the absurdity of, that goes with defending the lie we're, we're, we're a person. It's, it's dreamer-centered activity. I think I'm, my, my sort of, I haven't worked all this out yet, Greg, and, and I know there's this, the whole sort of neo-advaita, non-dual community, uh, uh, which I don't know whether you consider yourself a part of or not, but there, there are a number of teachers who um, have a similar kind of way of presenting knowledge. And then, and I, I, I sort of feel like there's something incomplete with it, in the sense that, yeah, I get the idea that everything is a, a dream, but at the same time, there's sometimes too much of what Adyashanti calls getting kind of stuck in the absolute view, where uh, the the relative nature of things is, uh, you know, albeit ultimately illusory, is is discounted too much. Like, let me give you an example. Um, well, let me just, I just want to say one thing. Okay. <clears throat> I'm now really clear in retrospect. That's what really attracted me to Wei Wu Wei. Uh -huh. His 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 description of what's going on is absolute. This is this is always a dream, and it's not relative. See, if I listen closely to all the dreamers talking and the guys mm -hmm. and people, they're all mm -hmm. arguing for the relevant. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's not a defect. That's not because they're evil. That's not because they're nasty. It's because dreamers argue for the relative because they don't like the absolute. We don't like it. The absolute says, there's not a chance in hell you're going to prove you're a person. And when you wake up and get that, guess what? You're going to start dancing. You're going to start having a little fun. Yeah. And what I'm saying is that uh, in the large... Are we having fun now? Look, see. Yeah, we're yeah. Starting, I love this. We're having fun. I'm noticing fun happening. Yeah, yeah. We're having fun. Yeah, we're having fun. As I understand it, um, in, in the Advaita tradition, uh, you know, in India, there's, uh, you know, well, maybe I shouldn't even speak in terms of the Advaita tradition because I'm not an, an expert in it. But the the term Brahman, which is considered to be the sort of penultimate realization in in that tradition, is thought to be inclusive. It's of. It, both the absolute and the relative. In other words, it's not just the absolute view. That's, that, that actually takes place several major stages before that, the realization of Brahman. But it's the, it's the realization that there's a larger wholeness, which is more than the sum of its parts, that, can, that includes both the absolute and the relative. And you know, someone with that realization would agree with you that ultimately the relative is uh, an illusion, is a dream. But at the same time, paradoxically, uh, it it has its significance. It has its value. It's not just utterly dismissed. And, well, and I mean, look, th does the relative exist, or is it nested in the absolute? See, what I'm saying is the absolute is absolute because it's true right now. It might, right now is the dream mind is dreaming, mm -hmm. and the dream mind is dreaming includes the dreamer arguing for the relative. So that really the lie is 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 part of the truth. We can't dualistically separate the lie of the relative from the absolute that's constant. Right. This is always a dream mind is dreaming, and guess what? Surprise, it features the dreamers in the dream arguing for the relative. You better believe. Mm -hmm. We're willing to die for the lie <laughs> that, that we're people. We're willing to die for the lie we're people. What do you think suicide is? We're willing to die for the lie we are a person. And I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've, yeah. I've worked so with, have I. I've worked with it, you know? Sure. Let's say that, uh, you know, you have... Let's let's talk in terms of physics for a minute. Um, molecules, let's or atoms might say, there's nothing here but atoms, you know, because looking around, that's all there is. There, you know, maybe there's subatomic particles or whatever. We'll just start with atoms, uh, and you know, anything that if someone might say, here, well, here's a rock. The atom says it's nothing but atoms. You know, there is no rock. There's only atoms. Taking it up another level, you know, molecules might say. Well, there's nothing but molecules. This rock is all molecules. And fine, you know, we're composed of atoms, but, but really the, there is a level at which there are molecules. And then you can take it up another step. You know, I mean, cells in the body might truthfully say there's nothing but cells. 
uh, you know, there is no body. And they're right. They're, if, where's the body? It's all just this cell, this cell, this cell, trillions of them. Uh, it's all just cells. But then on a, on a more macroscopic level, you know, you have organs and all. And at every level, you could say, you could boil it right back down to nothingness, to the absolute, you know, to consciousness or whatever you want to call it, to, to, you know, to the vacuum state, which lies beyond all, all particles. Uh, yeah. But, you know, that... There's, you so, can, I mean, you know, I mean, it, but I mean, if, if you want to hang out even as, at the level of entertainment with the idea that this is a dream, then you start thinking of the wave particle thing. Uh, if the wave is more, makes this, whatever this is, this thing, this dream, seem wave-like. But it has the capacity to particulate as an apparent object mm -hmm. and cohere. Yeah. What is it that makes a Rick cohere? I mean, why don't you why don't you just not stop cohering and just not occupy space as a Rick? See, because the dream includes that the wave will particulate, and by the way, that drives physicists nuts because mm -hmm. they're trying to figure out why how that works. Right. And it may be another fifty years before someone says. You know what? This is really beginning to look like a dream that has the capacity to manifest as apparent things. Mm -hmm. Which would then take care of the void form thing pretty good. The form, the, the weight can particulate as form, but if you look at it, it's still void because it's just dream content. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I, as long as, I mean, you know, for instance, if a person took this view and thought, well, it's all a wait, dream. Wait, 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 yeah. if a person, people. There is no end to, people don't have points of view. Dreamers have points of view to impersonate people. Right, and, and you man, as a... And do we have belief systems in this dream? And when you understand they're all made up, I'm telling you, it's all you can do to keep from laughing. Because, and I don't mean you're being mean, you're just mm -hmm. aware that dreamers can't defend the lie they're people without belief systems. We just can't. Right. And you know how, you know how much we love to part with a belief system? Whoop! You will fight tooth and nails. Because the belief system gives the gives actually inflates the self or the ego and gives it to, something to represent. It represents it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, so would you say, for instance, then that um, you know you don't have a point of view about anything? Yes, I do. Uh, and what I'm saying is that apparently, if everything takes us to mind, then the, the only point of view I have is that apparently mind is all there is. And it's is, it, is it mind or is it, is it I, consciousness? I, I don't know. Wei Wei says you can't even use the word mind, and right. I understand right. what he's saying. But basically, if we're going to be dualistic, we're going to have to use the word mind or the, the discussion's over. We can't even talk, okay? Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is there is something that's unknown, which we'll probably never know, that's the dreamer of this dream, and why don't we give it the name mind so we can talk? Why is it unknown and why would we never know it? Because there's no one to know it. Can knowing it, can is can it know knowing, itself? Knowing is is knowing reinforces the lie. There's there's a knower to know something. Can it know itself? Ah, well, yeah. And are we it knowing itself? Well, if there's no duality, I, my guess is yeah. Uh huh. That's as close as we're going to get. But not as a person who's a knower. We're it knowing no, itself. No, right, and it knows God. itself. Now, don't you think that that's what enlightenment really is? When the Buddha awakened. Wasn't it, you know, the, in fact, when the Buddha awakened, he said all beings are enlightened. When, when you know, when the Buddha awakened, wasn't it the self waking up to itself uh, in the, in the, through the sort of mechanism of the Buddha? Well, was the self waking up to, uh, recon to recapture the fact that the infinite self, mind, is dreaming reality just the way it's manifesting? But it's content in a dream... And that the dream it's dreaming includes the dreamers, that's us. Actually, when he first woke up, as I understand the story, um, there was, he, for the time being, there was complete loss of awareness of any manifestation or, or creation or dreamers or anything else. It was just pure self-awareness, self-awake to itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I mean, isn't that the essence of the concept of mindfulness? It, it, as, back to the word emptiness, as all the personhood stuff falls away mm -hmm. and you're emptying out your, your, how you're, gonna, you're in the dream defending the lie you're a person, mm -hmm. you're letting go of stuff that supports the fiction you are a person and it gets emptier and emptier and emptier until finally what you're left with, mind's going on. And what is it doing? 
this. Well, it's doing this. You're left it with, the dog, with, it with the dog thing. It had the dog thing happen a few minutes ago. Yeah. And having, I mean, but what I'm getting at is, you know, there's this, this sense of, you know, when people meditate, for instance, uh, very often their experience is they, th there's a settling down and, a, a, as you were saying earlier, a sort of a dissolution of individuality. And, you know, to use the analogy of an ocean, the waves settle down and it's just pure ocean, pure awareness, pure sort of still, silent, unaware, un, you know, consciousness without an object, right? No, you're not, it's not experiencing something, it's just pure awareness. And then you, you get back to activity after that, and you're engaged in activity, and there's the whole dream world arises again. Or, or as, the, as the self starts to disappear in the process of meditation, mm -hmm. that's off the end of meditation. I'm not doing that anymore. Well, or, if, let's say the person doesn't give it up, they keep doing it, uh, yeah. you know, then they become accustomed to this experience. They become comfortable with yeah, I mean, with they begin the to disorder. really have fun. Maybe they begin to have fun with the awareness that there isn't anyone to have a self, and isn't it funny that I spend all my time arguing for one as if I have one? Yeah, and so it's no longer sort of a threat to them, or uh, you know, um, a, an alien experience to allow the individuality to to allow the drop to to merge with the ocean. You know, for sure. the, the snow for sure. the snowflake to land on the water and dissolve. You know what Wei Wei says? What? If you're going to meditate, for God's sake, don't pretend there's a person to do it. Right. But you might start out very much feeling that there's a person. Okay, oh, well, I'm, no, I'm, I'm sitting down equation. meditating I'm here. Equation. I'm a person, and guess what? Yeah. I am meditating. You'll actually brag about it. We love to say, I'm a meditator. Right, but and, you know, if, the process is, little... if the process is successful, though, then you, know, you discover that, there is no, that the individual is really cosmic. The, 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 sure. The particular is yeah. Here's the meditator stuck in the fiction. It's a person uh -huh. that's meditating, and it suddenly it settles down. The self sort of vaporizes. Right. And then what comes into focus next is I, I don't have a self. Maybe I'm a dreamer, and a dream was playing the part of a person with the self, and that's why I had it, and I'll be just fine without it. Well, even all that dialogue wouldn't be going on. It would just be no, the pure I mean, innocent experience of yeah. selflessness yeah. or of pure awareness. You know, if, if the meditation works, the dreamer comes out of the meditation less invested in the life of the person. Exactly. Right. And over over years of practice, if that's what the person does, uh, you know, that the grip uh, or the convincingness of, you know, the lie of a person just becomes more and more um, feeble. More. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> You know, if if it's true that we're dreamers in a dream impersonating people, then you understand the only real addiction is is to the fiction you are a person. Right. We're addicted to the fiction. We can successfully argue we're using duality and the self to document that I am some some kind of a person. And guess what? Proof for that is I feel like shit. Mm -hmm. I must be a person. <laughs> and and, the, and if you reverse the whole process, I can't prove I'm a person unless I feel like shit. I mean, that's where I got interested in, in psychotherapy, that a lot of the clients said, we're willing to pay me good money for me to intervene and see if I can't interrupt their suffering, how they feel like crap. And yet I was absolutely becoming increasingly aware that they were, I was getting a mixed message. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like crap. But don't you interrupt the process because I need it because it documents the lie to self is real because I have a broken self that's ruined. Well, that's what the ego does. I think it becomes addicted to, well, it has an innate tendency to try to perpetuate itself and, and controversy and suffering and arguments and conflict and all that are very powerful tools for keeping sure. it intact, you know? I mean, how can a dreamer argue for the lie it's a person without a self, without the concept to call self? Right. You can't do it. Now, Instead of being upset about that, you can see that is part of the dream mind is dreaming, that the dream includes the dreamer will invent the self to engage in the relevant. Mm -hmm. That the truth includes the lie, which is the relative. Now, if you investigate Buddhism, it, there are some 18 schools of Buddhism, and if you pay really close attention and you're a good scholar, you're going to find out they all rotate around whether things are, are absolute or relevant. Mm -hmm. And not only do they go at it, some of them hated each other. <laughs> I mean, they went. They didn't kill each other, but it got pretty close. Yeah, huh. they would talk to others. Those in another school whose point of view differed from their own, which is very egocentric. Even then, wasn't it? And they were Buddhists. 
Right. You know. Well, there's a similar kind of situation in Hinduism where you have the different schools of philosophy and you know the six six, six systems of Indian philosophy, and, and some people argue that those are just competing uh, doctrines, you know, and that they're actually at war with one another. But others, you know, suggest I think more wisely that they are just sort of perspectives at different stages of development, yeah. uh, and each is appropriate at, at its own stage, uh, but each sort of gives rise to the next. <laughs> as a, as this person evolves, you know, Wei Wu Wei would say that they're all content in the dream mind is dreaming, displaying levels of awareness about the truth that this is a dream. Mm -hmm. I really recommend you read some of them. I, first of all, he's a kick. Secondly, he's really funny. Yeah. And yeah. third, he's probably the brightest guy you're ever going to whose path you'll ever cross. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is outrageous, just uh, outrageous. I probably will. And I'll try to get. I, I, I started Open Secret again this week. At, for the 56th time, <laughs> and here it is, Yeah, and you can get it at Amazon, because all of his books now are available at Amazon, mm -hmm. and and just let him blow your mind, because yeah. he's succinct. He he, he has, in, in the guise of being a person, he occasionally becomes esoteric and arcane, and you sit there going, there he goes, mm -hmm. you know, bye-bye, hmm. but then he has the capacity, because of his range of awareness, to snap back into the truth. He's going right. arcane on you. He'll even make fun of it. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 har I hardly ever find the time to actually read. I listen to a lot of audio things, but I'll, I'll try to find the time, or maybe I'll be able to get a hold of some of his books on tape or something. Yeah, for sure. Um, once you read one, you're, you're going you're gonna to be hooked, because uh. you, you don't have to read them all. And, I, I, and it's true. If, if, if the truth is, mind is dreaming this dream called reality, then that's the only message he has, and he has 500 ways of saying it. Yeah. And he does say it over and over again, and he keeps trying to get you to get it. I mean, he's trying to get the dreamer to get it, that aren't you having fun pretending to be a person, even if you're using suffering? Yeah. I still have this doubt, and I don't suppose we're going to resolve it in this conversation, but um, I have this doubt that a lot of people read that stuff and listen to that stuff and end up kind of convincing themselves on an intellectual level of what he's saying and but it's different than uh, really living it on an experiential level as perhaps Buddha or Christ or you know any enlightened truly enlightened person um, ha or has done and excuse the, my use of the word person um, it's like a you know a king could a, per a person could con can say over and over to themselves I am a king I am a king I am a king I'm a king and eventually perhaps convince themselves that they are a king and all really have that in mind, but they're not actually a king. They haven't actually if, if, attained if, kingship. If there's a fly in the ointment. What's that? If this is a dream, your status in this dream is fixed. What do you mean? You've never been anything but a dreamer in this dream, busy trying to pretend to be a person. Your status is, is and that's funny, is fixed. You're a dreamer in the dream and you're laminating on that you're, you're, from all your experience and duality and, and all the stories that are running around in your head. You're laminating on top of a fixed fact this huge homunculus, this huge, this cancer that you're going to drag through time to try to advance the fiction. You're going to successfully prove you're not this, you're this. And what he's saying is as long as you hang on to this, plan on suffering because it's a lie. Mm -hmm. And when you let this go, you go, oh, I've never been anything but a dreamer in the dream. I don't, it isn't something that I have to wake up and get. It's something that was always there, and it's never been anything but an established fact. Yeah, now if a person really gets that... Uh, no, uh, uh, wait, a, dream, a dreamer will get it, because if what he's saying is true, it's mm -hmm. a fixed fact. It's not arbitrary. Right. You're going to be a dreamer today. You're going to be a dreamer tomorrow. Now, to what extent is Rick going to get into his Rick suit, his archer suit, mm -hmm. and do Rick stuff? And I'm not criticizing them. Mm -hmm. I'm saying plan on it. What do you mean plan on it? Plan on the fact that you're going to probably be featured in the dream, shifting from the, the, what's constant, you're a dreamer in the dream, into the fiction you're some kind of a person who's got troubles and problems and aches and pains and the dog, you know, whatever you're up to. No, I'm never locked into that anymore. Uh, years ago I was. Uh, but there's always uh, now an awareness of that which is beyond the dream, um, even when I'm asleep, pretty much. 
uh, although, you know, sometimes when you sleep, you just sleep. But, you know, I'll be snoring. My wife will wake me up. Hey, you're snoring. I'll realize I was already awake. You know, awareness was already there, uh, even though the body was snoring. So, you know, for me, the whole importance of this the whole discussion, the whole consideration of awakening or enlightenment or whatever terminology you want to use is, is very much an experiential thing. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I just, I'm, I'm just expressing this as a cautionary note because people go to seminars, weekend seminars these days where they hear someone talk about non-duality and they think they've got it. And I'm not suggesting that that's the case with you because, I mean, you've been devoted, you do, no, no, devoting no, no, decades to this. The problem is if you think you've got it, then you still think there's a person to get it. Yeah. The, the, the or, dream, what the dreamer gets is... Uh, this is a dream, I'm a dreamer of the dream, and that's a fixed fact that has never changed since the day I showed up in the dream. What showed up is that what got laminated on top of that is I'm featured in the dream arguing for the relative. Yeah. That I'm something other than a dreamer in this dream. And the dreamer inside of you is saying, are you really going to do that? Are you really going to grandstand? Are you going to really put on that absurd show? Yes, I am. There's a dialogue <laughs> huh. going on all the time. Truth is looking at you kind of going, have fun. Right. You know, you are a jerk. Well, there is, there is something these days which uh, some people call the neo-advaita shuffle, you know, where people use terminology and concepts to argue, uh, to argue this perspective that, that it's all a dream and that there is no person and so on and so forth. But uh, they haven't actually, you know, realized that experientially. Uh, in, in, to the extent that it can be realized, to the extent that Ramana Maharshi realized it, or Shankara realized it, or any, any of the great seers. Uh, and yet they think, they convince if themselves. In this dream, if you're a dreamer in this dream, the only thing you can do is pretend you're not that. So if you're a dreamer in the dream and I'm in the dreamer in the dream, we're equal. We are absolutely in the dream, a wide awake, arguing for the relative periodically. Periodically. You will get people in the dream arguing for the relative, that I'm not a dreamer in the dream, that is ridiculous, that's a strange concept. And I'm saying, but what if it's a fixed fact that's the only thing you can be if, if this is a dream? I what, if, what if tomorrow suddenly you went, oh my God, I've always been a dreamer in this dream, I always knew it was one, and I've been busy playing the part of some kind of a person. Yeah. With problems, or whatever you've got going, you know, we all get people doing it. And, and the... And, the ability to wake up to the extent that you can see you're a dreamer who's featured in the dream putting on this show, like Shakespeare said, is the essence of humor. I told you originally I pay a lot of attention to comedians. Because? Because I'm trying to discern, one, who is the good one, whatever that means, uh -huh. and two, how, how, what is it that they're saying get, gets the whole audience to actually crap their drawers they're <laughs> laughing so hard? Yeah. What is going on? And I'm listening to that dreamer somehow in a, in a way that's not mean, waking the audience up to the fact they're all phonies. Unless it's Don Rickles. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, there are good ones and there are ones that are pretending to be funny and they're not yeah. funny. No, some, yeah, a, comedy, I think, is a, is a, can be a spiritual technique because it sort of, um, it creates this sort of leap of, uh, you know, across a chasm of, uh, it, it sort of suspends our, our ordinary, uh, you know, calcified, locked-in condition, and that's why we laugh, you know. Yeah, I mean, a good comedian reconnects you with the fact you're a dreamer impostering being a person. Yeah. And people, people start pulling your chain, and you don't know why you're feeling uncomfortable, but he's getting dangerously close to the fact you impersonate a person, which is reason enough to feel embarrassed. Embarrassment is the sign we already know the truth. We're not who we purport to be, and that we might get caught today. And look, the worst fear is uh, we have is public speaking. Not mine. You gotta ask I did a lot of it, so I'm, I'm okay with yeah, it. Yeah, but, but I'm saying it's number one. Right. Number hmm. one fear. And if you ask, well, well why, why should that be? You're knowledgeable. You know the topic. You're able to talk. You're, you're, you're interesting. You're engaging. You have good language. You have good presentation. That's not the issue. The issue is someone in the audience might catch on that you're putting on a show and you're not who you appear to be. Hmm. Let's get. I mean, let people, me. going, people have panic attacks. So I worked a lot with panic attacks. Right. And, and the panic know. attack is that you're very close to finding out the truth that you're an imposter. 
Yeah, also to my, in my terminology, I would say that the person who's terrified of public speaking is, is kind of locked into an individual perspective which feels threatened by being up in front of a thousand people or whatever. If they were really residing in, in the universal awareness, to, uh, then you know, the individual could be very comfortable getting up in front of a, of a crowd and speaking because you know, the, the, there would be a predominant feeling of mothers at home, you know, a feeling of contentment, security, comfort, uh, you know. You know, Rick, what? you're the one that's intellectual. <laughs> it's Maybe. interesting. But I'm you speaking know, of experience. Talking, that's the talking, thing. I... You're, talk, you're talking about who is intellectual. You're very intellectual. You're a very bright guy. But you're also, if there's any drawback to what's going to take you to the next level, mm -hmm. it's that you're still intellectual. Could be. You say, what could happen in the process of waking up, even if you just play act, mm -hmm. just to see what it feels like, walk into a room of people and see them all as dreamers. And now watch how the dreamers are playing the part of people and stay tuned in and fascinated. Your eyes get big, your ears really like radar, you're watching them, and some of it's embarrassing because they're doing what you're doing, but they're doing it better than you. But in a way, that's an intellectual exercise. You're walking into a room and you are sort of saying, okay, I'm going to walk in this room and I'm going to just sort of play this little mind game uh, of seeing everybody as dreamers while I'm in this room. I'm not going to be totally spontaneous. I'm going to kind of have this idea in the back of my head as I walk into the room. Uh, to get back to the Jesus Christ example, yeah, but I, I mean, but I said to you, pretend. Oh, pretend. Well, they, yeah, but that's I, I, still a mind a, game. It's still an exercise. I'm pretending. Well, yeah, I'm doing a know, thing when part, I go. How, the question is, how is any dreamer going to get past amnesia that, that shields you from the truth? You're not a person. By having, well, I, I think that there's, you know, I agree. I mean. This, this sort of intellectual understanding and the, the reading and dwelling on this as you have done through reading that book 56 times, it does get into your blood, you know, it gets into your bones, uh, the, that perspective, and it, I imagine it becomes quite unshakable. But um, well, no, what I'm saying is, this is consciousness. Mm -hmm. Here is the truth that mind is consciousness, mm -hmm. and here I am in consciousness, featured, arguing for the relative to insist I'm a person. Now look, I'm studying and reading, and mm -hmm. at some point here I begin to go, oh my God, I'm not who I appear to be. Uh -huh. And that's not intellectual awareness. Right. I'm actually reconnecting with something at this end of the equation, okay. which will okay. reveal, if I keep moving, that I've never been anything but a dreamer in this dream. And you know what? There's nothing intellectual about that, because there's no one to be intellectual. I get that. So what you're saying is that, the, you know, for you, the process of studying and reading and uh, all that stuff uh, was a, we could say, a serve the purpose that for another person meditation might serve where it, it sort of shifted you incrementally bit by bit to the point where that perspective of everything is a dream became unshakable is that is that fair to say well, it's it, not that it's it, unshakable it's that truth is is, ab is absolute yeah see there's nothing intellectual if truth is absolute meaning right now right now is the dream mind is dreaming that that, is, that isn't saying on alternate wednesdays that's true it's saying that's what's sure, so. all, all the time that's the way it is yeah yeah, yeah. mind is dreaming right now including us having this interesting discussion about mm -hmm. dreamers in the dream let's say it's true that um, christ was so grounded in in reality so grounded in the divine or whatever you want to call it that um, he was actually beyond suffering on the cross. Although you know the body was going through what it was going through, uh, you know he he resided at a level where he could truly have said, "I am not suffering. There's no suffering here." Um, if you were put in that situation, would you be able to say that? I doubt it. Me neither. I mean, I'd be I screaming my I head off. It. But I tell you, a lot of interesting things have happened. We could spend hours on it, in which I now no longer see things the same way, so that some aspects, the qualia of the experience of suffering has subsided, and now is, is changing enough so that I even look at some aspects of suffering from a place of humor rather than upset. Sure. But so, so by bringing up that Christ example, I'm, I, I brought it up to illustrate the point I've been trying to get at, which is that there's a maturation of experience which can go so deep that it's far beyond any kind of it, it's 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 so deeply grounded that anything that happens to us uh can't shake it you know and yeah, you're, you're you're beyond the lie you're a person yeah and you're but you're beyond it so uh profoundly and so stably 
you know, so unshakably that, that it just can't be lost no matter what. And yeah. uh, whether you, uh, like Ramana Maharshi and the Sargadatta, they both died of cancer. And sure. uh, they, you know, during their, they'd be giving a talk and then they'd scream, you know, or something in pain. And then they'd keep giving the talk and their, their followers would say, oh, my God, you know, you, you must be feeling pain. We feel so bad for you. And he'd say, no, no, it's just, you know, I'm, not, I'm beyond that. I'm not feeling pain. I mean, you know, the, the, the body is in pain, but that's one, not me. One, one story about the Buddha is when he was dying, his disciples were around him mm -hmm. and they were crying. And allegedly he looked at them and said, I didn't teach you a damn thing. Right? Yeah, right. Not in those words, but in effect, you think there's a need to a real person to die. You understand? Death takes place in the dream and has nothing to do with people. Yeah. And you guys are still stuck in the idea there is me, a person who's dying right now. So, I failed. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so from his perspective, and obviously he was that was a living experience for him. He was not just sort of philosophizing about nobody dying that he was he knew he was that which cannot die and yeah. that was his living reality so so that's all i've been trying to get at is that you know all of this can be taken as a mind trip you know it can be uh, adopted as a way of talking a way of thinking which isn't necessarily being deeply lived by the person and i'm just cautioning against that i you know i'm i'm just saying that uh, what you're saying is true, but it really needs to be a living reality and not just an intellectual concept. And I'm not accusing you of having it be an intellectual concept, but I think it very often happens to people, especially after sometimes just a little bit of superficial dabbling in it. They think, okay, I get the concept. I know what he's saying. I'm, in this, I'm there, you know, I'm done. Yes. I've given up the search, blah, blah. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, in the process of waking up, I have days when I'm absolutely, there's no connection to a person. Mm -hmm. And I'm just having a wonderful time here, just being this. And then I get featured in the dream, since there's no one running anything. I get mm -hmm. featured in the dream, reverting back to Greg Tucker. Mm -hmm. And the difference is that I now can feel when that sh when I've shifted back into the relevant. I can feel it. Yeah. And instead yeah. of being at the effect of the shift, I now just notice that shifting's happening. Mm -hmm. Because all of us in the dream, until you're until you're absolutely devoid of any attachment to anything physical or real here, mm -hmm. you're still going to oscillate between what's true and what's false. Well, what I'm suggesting is that that oscillation can, one, one can outgrow that oscillation um, to the point where it's, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, even very highly enlightened people, uh, to use that term again, can, can get overshadowed, but it can be, it, it gets to the point where it's just very fleeting and, you know, it's really hard to stay kind of like uh, diluted for, for more than a moment and, and you know so so there is this idea of growth even though uh, you know people don't like you know the talk of levels of awareness and evolution and all that stuff well, but, I mean, but this, is, this is something that one continues to mature into more and more profoundly o over time yeah but I mean, I started off by saying truth doesn't sell, and you can see why. I mean, if if 99.9% .9 of the dreamers are featured in the dream, uh, you arguing for the lie they have a damaged self to prove they are not okay person. Mm -hmm. They sure as don't want to hell. There's no one to be a person because there's no one to have a self. So you understand, truth in the dream is, is viewed as the enemy, and in the context of the dream, that's comedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think you know. Most of the people that are listening to this are, are kind of beyond that point. They're, they're, you know, they've, they're very interested in, they're not wallowing in their suffering and, and taking any sort of you know, pleasure in it. They're, they're for the most part in, interested in getting out of it if they're still in it or learning to sort of art, articulate what they're experiencing if, you know, if, they've, if they've quite significantly shifted uh, to, a, you know, to an, a realized state. Sure. Uh, that's, I think, primarily our audience. Um, well, that's what made them fun, and I, that's why I listened to most of them, because I was interested, where were they with the truth they were dreamer in the dream? And to what extent are they still arguing for the lie there's some kind of a less than okay person, or they're suffering? Yeah. So it's a captive audience, which was really fun to, to hang out with, uh, <laughs> hang out with Richard, Richard's group and your group, because, you know, it's sort of like, I tell you, I love to watch prison shows on TV, mm -hmm. 
because I love to see how dreamers, called prisoners, have to create bad behavior to document they have a bad self. Huh, yeah. In other words, that's their persona as the bad guy with all the tattoos and the big muscles and... Well, no, they have to commit crime. Crime is confirmation. I'm a bad person. I'm with a rotten uh, self. Yeah. And they're recidivists, and it, it buffaloes the psychologist. You say you hate prison. Why did you go out and rob a bank within three weeks? What, right. what is your problem? Are you some kind of a whacked up? He doesn't get it. Robbing banks substantiates the lie I must have a self because the one I have is bad. Mm -hmm. Look, it just robbed another bank. Like the band sang, I'm a thief and I dig it. I don't know if you remember that song. Uh, but uh, but this, this touches upon a point that I just want to bring up um, and maybe we won't go on too much longer. But um, this, this whole thing of sort of realizing that, you know, what, that there is no person and it's all a dream and so on and so forth, to my mind, does not absolve people of the value of becoming a better person. And very often this, this whole talk of realization or the, even the experience of realization, uh, some people use that as a cop-out for atrocious behavior and say that, well, it's all, a, it's all an illusion, you know, it's, I'm not really involved in this behavior, I can, you know, I can do this with money or with, with women or whatever, and, and uh, I'm beyond all that, you know, it's just a crazy wisdom, it's just a play, and so on and so forth. And, you know, I, I, I personally take exception to that, I feel that true... I just don't, I don't buy it, I just don't buy it. There, there's still a dreamer... Indulging in the dream. It, it, it's stuck in the fiction they are a person who's now pretending they're enlightened. Could be. And therefore, they have the right to go out and do atrocious things. You know, when you drop the lie you're, you're a person, you stop doing atrocious things because you're not trying to prove you're a person by being generating atrocious behavior. Really? So then would you, the, would you uh, stipulate as a criterion then for genuine, uh, genuinely having dropped the, the notion that you're a person, that there will be a profound shift in, in the quality of your behavior? Oh, there's no question. Okay. There's no, there's no question. So one will become more compassionate or whatever. I'll give, I'll give you an example. I work with a lot of dreamers in which they, the way in which they anchor the lie they have a self is they're stuck in a parody in which they play the part of a loser. Uh -huh. It is so common. It's like when it walks through the door, I go, ah, oh, here's another one. <laughs> you know, and their attachment to the fiction they're a loser is profound mm -hmm. because that anchors the lie I must be a person because the self I have is somehow defective, damaged, or flawed. Now, in order to play the part of a loser, you have to go out and lose. Mm -hmm. You can't document you're a loser and not generate behavior which supports the fiction, I am a loser. When they start to wake up and they engage in this thing, which I call the recovery process, yeah. uh, they start, in the process of waking up, they identify what they do to sustain the fiction they're a loser and start to realize it won't work to prove they have a damaged self. Mm -hmm. And that's the beginning of going, things start falling away. Mm. What they had to do to anchor the lie, I, a loser is a real person, no longer is relevant. Hmm. In fact, there's a, a tipping point at which playing the part of a loser is even laughable because there's no one to be that. So you feel that uh, in your experience as a psychologist and, and also as a, as a so-called quote-unquote spiritual teacher, whatever you want to call this that you do. I call it dream work. Dream work, okay. You feel that um, you've... That Conditioning is not etched in stone. That that the you know deeply seated habit patterns or personality traits and so on that may have taken a lifetime to build up can actually be shifted quite uh, quite quickly if uh, this real if this sort of realization dawns in a person. Well, I mean, theoretically, there there's documentation that it's happened in a split second with with no intervention. Just uh -huh. someone walking in the woods and they hear a, a twig snap and suddenly. What, what dawns on them is, oh, this is a moment in the dream, and it sticks. Yeah. Did you and, listen and, to and my interview know. with uh, Takwin Minamoto? Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was he almost got hit by a car, and, and the shock of that somehow shifted yeah, him, yeah. and that was it. Well, that's a whole other story, because if you work with post-traumatic stress disorder, was combat what ruined the dreamer's life, or did the shock of combat open up the portal to truth so that it, what it saw as an aspect of truth is, there's no, I have no control and there isn't any. Mm. And instead of making that okay, you use the combat event 
as the excuse to now play the part of a wrecked person, including I'm going to destroy my family, commit huh. suicide, and do all kinds of weird things when I get home from war. So, so the PTSD guys that you've <coughs> been dealing with, you've you've seen that um, <coughs> profound alleviation of their PTSD as a result a of this work. Absolutely. If I can get them to, to realize that they're a dreamer who used the war to play the part of a wrecked person, mm -hmm. and they're willing to at least play with that as an idea, uh -huh. it's interesting that they begin that their investment in in documenting they were ruined by the war subsides. And how successful are you in, in that? Like, what's your track record if you saw 100 well, I mean, people, how many? Not, it's, not, it's not as if I had 50 cases. We're talking maybe seven cases in uh -huh. the last 10 years. You know, uh, What I would love to do is get some funding and go somewhere, to drum it up, and go get 50 guys before they kill themselves. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and come at them with this approach, and you present it in a way of, look, gentlemen, you're having a terrible time, you really feel like crap, war is hell, and how many of you, if you could, would like to feel better? Hands go up. Sure. All right, we're going to play an entirely different game, an entirely different perspective, in which we're going to look at the war in a brand new way. And let's, if you can play that game, let's see what happens to your point of view about life. Have you ever considered going into a prison? And uh, sometimes you can get permission to do that, especially you as a, as a licensed psychologist. Could You could go in there and Byron Katie has gone into prisons and some other people like that. Could you go in and uh, set something up and actually work with some people? It's just one problem. Is that? You try to explain what you're doing to those in charge, they immediately go into into terror and turmoil, like I did when I read Way Way Way, and the hair will raise on their arms because they already know that they aren't what they purport to be, and they're busy defending the lie they have control. They're in charge of the of the prisoners. They're bad. I'm good. The huh. whole morality play is going on right there, hmm. and you're viewed then not just as a problem that possibly might stir up the 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 prisoners, but you might stir up the wardens. Yeah, I know. It's just a thought. I mean, people, you know, teachers of various kinds do manage to get into prisons and set up programs and talk to the, you know, uh, Gangaji, same thing. She she went into some prisons and gave some programs. So theoretically, you could do that. It'd be interesting to see. I mean, yeah. give you a oh, chance to really yeah. be an acid test of <laughs> this whole yeah. thing. Well, I, you know, I'm seeing 15 people a week. That's all I want to see. And yeah. everything's by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And these are all either... S People that have been on the path, dreamers on the path, are already kind of halfway there, mm -hmm. and have run across my blog or my website, or have talked to someone that's worked with me, and they say, you know, that sounds different. Somehow it resonates. I'd, I'd like, I'd like to play with that. Uh -huh. Do you do, you do like you, you have little sessions with Skype with people? Well, that's how I work entirely. Uh -huh. Do you charge they, them, or I, I, do you do it just for Chicago, fun? They're in Chicago, New York, I mean, wherever. Uh, the distance doesn't matter. Do you charge a consulting fee, or is it? I, I charge for it. Yeah, I charge uh -huh. seventy-five for the hour. Uh huh. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I wish I could charge nothing, but I got to pay the bills. Sure. Yeah. I uh -huh. really wish I could charge nothing. Yeah. I mean, I, I would love that, but uh, I'd go under quick. Then I would be a dreamer that has no food. <laughs> right. No dream food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, people, uh, you know, we'll have this on the website, and uh, people will have links to your site and everything, so that if people, you know, want to get in touch with you and and have some sessions, they can do yeah. that. Yeah. And I, and you might get some interesting feedback because, as I said, if you ask the critical question, "What is it we are at war with?" Mm -hmm. It's only we're at war with truth. Yeah. That we, we transfer the war to truth to people to avoid identifying we're at war with truth. Mm -hmm. I'd rather pretend you're my problem than I'm at war with truth. And that's where reality gets fairly scary and strange. Yeah. Well, I, because I, everyone's at war with truth, and yet we don't want to know that's what, what's going on. So I, we, 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 we make everything people-based. We externalize it's my mother, it. It's my father, it's my uncle. Right, it's, it's Osama bin Laden. It's, it's all the these Russians, other... it's the Jews, you know, whatever. Yep. Yep. You understand that as long as we transport from the real problems to dismiss it because we don't want to relate to it, yeah. reality is filled with chaos. <laughs> My father used to chain smoke, and he'd say, oh, this weather, you know, I can't stand the humidity. <laughs> As if it really bothers my sinuses. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. All righty. Well, uh, and, this and, is... And, you know, it's really interesting when you assist a client to shift from thinking people are the problem to really realize they're, they're at war with truth. Yeah. Because it, 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 first of all, evens out the playing field and pulls people out of the equation because that is a waste of time. Mm-hmm.
And you, you always, tell me. And by the way, you always talk? lose. As Byron Katie says, whenever you whenever you fight the truth, you always lose. <laughs> yeah, well, but I mean, if you're going to go on for 35 sessions, your mother ruined you, and you didn't have a mother because she's a dreamer, and you're not, you weren't ruined by because you're not a victim. Mm. I would say that's a waste of your dollars and our time. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Well, this has been good. I feel like um, I got. A, I have. I feel like I have a lot to learn with regard to, you know, despite my whole decades of spiritual practice and so on and so forth. The, there's. I have some things to come to terms with in terms of this whole terminology and the way you sure. the way you no, speak. I, uh, I have a different language. Yeah, I really do. I I haven't laid all the language on you. I was pretty. I'm being pretty selective. Okay. But there is a different language that's upstream of the lie we're people, and then the downstream language is dualistic. It services the lie we are people. Uh -huh. So there's not what we're saying in the downstream realm. Okay, on yeah. this side of amnesia, there is really uh, valid. I mean, I could say, please pass the butter, but if this is a dream, what butter? What in hell are you asking? Well, me to then do? that gets ridiculous. I mean, you know, well, yeah. you say, yeah, please I mean, pass the butter. Who wants the butter? Who, there is no person. Yeah, yeah, there is I mean, no that's, butter. That's, I mean, that's the functional you, you element. Can't, you can't the live that way. Of the relative. Right. And even that's funny. You can joke about the butter. Like, what do you want, the red butter or the green butter? I mean, really, there's humor inherent in all of duality. Sure. It, I there's mean, no such thing. Wouldn't you agree that defending lie duality is real is what humor is? Yeah, yeah. You say That's that. Funny. That's the funny. The first time I took LSD when I was a teenager, we sat around all night and and we played this game where you couldn't just say, you know, you couldn't just say something to the person. You had to sort of say, you had to preface it with ego to ego. I think this, you know, to to make sure that you both realize you were just speaking from your egos, you know, and not right. from not from truth. But you yeah. know, obviously, we were at the same time mixed up, confused kids, and there was a lot to to sort out in terms of <laughs> genuine. Well, you know, there's been a, there's been a regenerated interest in LSD, and they're bringing it back to want to study it because they're beginning to realize that something really profound does happen, and maybe if it's modified or chemically modified, it might become a valuable tool yet again. It, it's come and gone several times, but yeah, it's, coming, it's coming back. There's I've listened to some interesting in uh, interviews with Stanislav Grof recently, and, and he's yeah. one of the pioneers in that. And you know, if used wisely, it, it can be a, it definitely blows the doors open. It, if nothing else, it convinces you, you know, it shows you very profoundly that your your perspective is not what you thought it was, and that there's and, yeah, and yeah. That, that everything depends upon how you see the world, not not in changing the world, but changing right. your perspective is the is the key thing. Exactly, I mean somehow it punches a hole yeah. to amnesia and allows you to reconnect the fact that nothing is what it appears to be. Yeah, yeah. It is something, but it's not just what the mind is insists it is, because the mind, the function of the mind is to create stories and then defend them as facts. Yeah, someone put it. Uh, someone put it, and I don't know whether you'd agree with this or not. It, it, it's not that the world is an illusion; it's that our perception of it is an illusion. It, oh, exactly. It, Look, yeah. if if it's true you're a dreamer in a dream, and that's a fixed fact, I'm saying that's a constant. Then that's what's real. But you're going to insist because you're featured insisting as, as, as to defend the relative in the dream that you're a person. You're delusional. Yeah. And you're going to you're going to insist that you are the person you insist you are, which makes you doubly delusional. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, this is fun. You yeah. know, I, I, was, I was a little. I had some trepidation about trying to use re the language I like to use, mm -hmm. and then I finally decided I don't care. I really don't care what anyone thinks about it. They can like it. Oh yeah, it, and I, it, I wouldn't want you to have uh, pulled punches or to have used, you know. Well, just that I'm 78 years old. I, I don't much got him. Nah, come on. At 78, you know, the old TikTok on the dream is running out. Yeah. Your, your time is getting close to the end. So why are you going to sort of hedge your bets? <laughs> well, I hope I'm as sharp as you are when I'm 78. In fact, I wish I were as sharp as you are now. But um... you are. <laughs> I think, no, no, that's part of your game to imagine that you're not. Uh -huh. You understand? If we are all mind. Don't we all share in the same sharpness at some level and to some degree? At some level and to some degree. But th there again, we, we can open up a whole other can of worms here, and I'm going to go eat dinner. But um, there, w what's critical is the extent to which it's lived, to the extent to which it's manifest. Um, I, not critical. I mean, fine, everyone plays their role. But, what, but there's, I think, no end to which we can... Uh, give fuller and fuller expression uh, to this reality. There's no end to which our perception can be refined, no end to which our 
compassion can be expanded and so on. And so be the, if it's a dream, fine, but the dream can be enriched and there's value in enriching it. You know, yeah. clear mind, good heart, all that stuff is worth developing, even though you ultimately you might consider it to be illusory. I mean, one of the things that my clients have to deal with, and they all get to deal with, uh -huh. is in the name of personhood, they specify that by Friday I'm going to wake up. So they're still arguing for the fiction that there's someone to, to run waking up. Right. Waking up is an event that happens in the dream when it does. When not it's good and ready. The, well, not because the dream reposing as a person, so it's going to happen by Friday. Good luck. Right. By the way, that's funny. It's going can't, to happen by Friday. Can't the storm the gates of heaven, so to speak. Yeah, no, it, it will happen when it does, not because you say so, because it's happening. Yeah. And sometimes when I slide out of personhood, I'm mm -hmm. telling you, and I get this incredible feeling of joy and bliss, mm -hmm. all the things they talk about, mm -hmm. and I start to laugh. I mean, what I thought was serious, it just isn't. Yeah, yeah. It just isn't. Right. And, you know, and I, and I, and, and I realized ten minutes ago, it was damn serious. <laughs> we have an absolute, we have a serious responsibility not to be serious. <laughs> all right. This has been fun, Rick, and it I has. really... I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. I didn't know what we're, what we were going to be talking about or exactly. I, you know, I'm so busy that I don't often don't have a chance to really research my guests beforehand, and so I just sort right. of, I, I kind of say, okay, well that's the way it's going to be, and I'm just going to wing it and see what this person has to say. Right. And I really enjoyed, you know, what you had to say, and it's really yeah. stretched me. I think stretched my uh, ability to understand and to to, you know. Um, deal Notice with, that when we're rapping, uh -huh. the investment in the self as rapping disappears, and the self disappears. And what replaces it is sort of spontaneity and fun, so that no one's pre-planning what they're saying. They're resonating back and forth at a very fast oscillation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that yeah. we're getting we're getting closer to one thing talking rather than two things talking. Good point. Uh huh. Good. And it's experiential. You can feel it. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, move back to Sun Valley and I'll come and visit you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going back. I'm all done with the snow. I've changed too many tires and had too many pipes thawed and too many cars that froze. Yeah. I'm, I'm here. All righty. Come well, visit maybe, me in California. I'll, I'll visit you there. All right. All right. Take care. Thanks. So Thank uh, let me just wrap it up here. So uh, you, you have been listening to or watching uh, Buddha at the Gas Pump. And uh, depending upon how you've been listening or watching to this, watching this, uh, you know, you, you might be on YouTube or listening to a podcast or whatever. But there's one place where you can go where you'll find all of this and then find links to various ways of dealing with it, and that is batgap.com. B-A-T-G-A-P. It's an acronym for Buddha at the Gas Pump. So go there. You'll find a sort of a an archive of all the interviews that have been done so far, and they and a new one is added every week. And uh, my next guest is going to be a Tibetan Lama, who um, is, I, I can't pronounce his name, I'll, I'll get that straight before I interview him, uh, but he's visiting from India, I believe, because he's in exile from Tibet, and um, he uh, it, it promises to be a very different and interesting interview. So that'll be coming up next, and we'll see you then. Thank you for watching. <laughs>